Whoppa! Welcome to a masterclass about climbing ropes. In this video we are gonna look into different types of climbing ropes. I'm also gonna explain how many falls you can take on a typical climbing rope and how to extend its lifespan. Plus why ropes twist and kink and what to do about this and many other tips and tricks related to climbing ropes. This video is part of Belay Masterclass series where I go into deep details of climbing techniques and safety and each episode builds on top of the previous ones so if you're a beginner I highly recommend to watch them in order. Let's go! So, if you would gut your climbing rope you would find these white strands inside. This is called a core and it contributes to majority of the climbing rope's strength. While the sheath, which is outside, is protecting the core and it's highly resistant to abrasion. Ah, beautiful. And then in some of the ropes you have this plastic inside which has extra information about the rope, including its production date. It's a sterling rope first quarter of 2017 while other ropes might just have this colored thin strip every year manufacturers change the color of this plastic and if you ask them they might tell you what's the date of production of this rope so we have dynamic ropes and static ropes and to be more precise, completely static ropes do not exist. That's why on some of the manufacturer websites they will be listed as semi-static or low stretch. These static ropes normally stretch between 2 and 5% when they are statically loaded, while a dynamic rope would stretch about 8% if you would just statically hang on a dynamic rope. Now, if you would take a really hard lead fall, on a dynamic rope that would stretch this rope up to maybe 20 percent while manufacturers will list dynamic elongation between 30 and 40 percent but that's on really hard lab tests that are impossible to achieve in real life a really cool fact about climbing ropes is that while they are designed to stretch they are also designed to not stretch too much otherwise during the fall you would just go all the way to the ground and on top of that, they are also designed to not create impact forces that could injure the climber. So that means that you can take pretty much any imaginable climbing fall and you should be fine. And in fact, big falls usually tend to be softer than small falls because you have more dynamic rope to absorb that fall. And I already made a video explaining all of that in greater details, so highly recommend to watch that. And static ropes... Well, you should not fall on a static rope to begin with and they are made for applications where minimum stretch is required, for example, ascending a rope. If I would try to ascend a dynamic rope, this is what happens. Okay. And now, now fighting against the bungee jump. Whee! And in the case of static rope, this is how it looks. And I'm already sitting. And now to go up. Much less of a bungee jump. There are three types of dynamic ropes. First one is single ropes. They are marked with a little circle with number one inside and sometimes says single. And that just means that you need a single rope and you can go climbing. And that's what's mainly used in sport climbing. <laughs> and these ropes range from 9 to 10 millimeters thickness. Next we have half ropes. They are marked as a half in a circle. They are also sometimes called a double ropes. They are thinner and lighter than single ropes but you need two of them to go climbing. When climbing with half ropes, you need to clip them in alternating pattern. So I have this one clipped here, then I clip the next one to another protection point, then I clip this one here, and it's ideal if I can clip 
all the protection points on my right side with one rope, while all the protection on my left side with the other rope, like so. This would also reduce the friction a lot compared to climbing with a single rope, but it can also lead to a lot of mess when you need to deal with two ropes. When you take fall on half ropes, the first rope is gonna take majority of the impact, while the second rope is gonna assist in that. So it's gonna be something like, I fall, this rope gets tense, and after some time this rope gets tense as well and helps the other rope. So most of the impact will go to the top rope. Climbing with two ropes is usually done in alpine or multi-pitch scenarios where damage to the ropes is more likely, so having two of them is obviously safer. Plus, when you need to repel to go down, you can tie both of your ropes together and that lets you to repel greater distances. And the last category is called twin ropes. They are marked as two overlapping circles. Usually they are thinner than double ropes, but same as double ropes, you need two of them to go climbing. The difference is that twins like to be together like good twins. And when you climb with twin ropes, you need to clip them together. You clip them together. So twin ropes you clip together, while half ropes you clip separate. Now a question, can you clip half ropes together? So, is this okay to do with half ropes? Well, in general, you should use your ropes only for the types of climbing that they are certified for. Twin ropes are designed to be more stretchy, so when you fall on two of them, you will receive the correct amount of elasticity. While in double rope case, as I mentioned before, the first rope takes majority of the fall and the second rope just assists a little bit. If you would clip two double ropes to one protection point, that could result into very hard catch. However, some ropes might be certified for multiple uses. For example, it might say that it's okay to use this rope for single rope, for double rope and for twin rope. In that case, feel free to use your rope in any way you desire. Now, imagine a millimeter, tiny, tiny millimeter. Now imagine a third of the millimeter, it's super tiny. But if you would take a rope which is 9.5 millimeters and you would take a rope which is 9.8 millimeters, which is only a third of the millimeter difference, you would feel a difference. 9.8 definitely feels thicker and the rope will be heavier. So we are kind of used to this 9.8, 9.5, but think about it, it's only a third of the millimeter. That's crazy. I don't know, maybe it's just me who sees joy in such things in life. But let's continue. Typically, a single rope will range between 9 and 10 millimeters thickness. And the thicker the rope is, the more durable it's gonna be, the longer it's gonna last you. However, skinnier ropes will reduce friction, they go easier through quick draws and belay devices, and they also feel nicer to clip. My personal sweet spot for outdoors rope is 9.5 millimeters. I had a couple of 9.2s in the past and while it feels very nice to climb with them, it doesn't take very long until you need to cut them. And anything above 9.8 already feels very thick and heavy. However, if you are mainly planning to climb indoors, then thicker rope is actually a good option because indoors the roots are shorter and they have way less drag. So thicker rope is gonna be fine and it's gonna last you longer. And another thing to be aware of, if the rope is super thin and stiff, it might be difficult to pull on it. For example, my friend had this 9.4 millimeter rope and after a few days of climbing with this rope, my little finger was already bleeding. I was cutting my finger every time I was pulling on the rope. And another super interesting fact about climbing ropes is that over time they swell in diameter, they get thicker and they shrink in length. So just after first few uses the rope might shrink already a few percent and then up to 10% over its life span. And that's why manufacturers will typically cut the ropes a little bit longer than what they are specified. 
For example, Mahmoud says that we will cut the rope two and a half percent longer. Okay, so what length of the rope should you get? If you're planning to climb mostly single pitch routes, then I would highly recommend 80 meters rope. First of all, it's already getting quite common to find routes up to 40 meters length. And obviously you need at least 80 meters rope to be able to go up and down such route. And also the most damage to the ropes typically occur at the ends of the ropes. That's why you can cut the ends of the ropes and still have very usable length of the rope left. I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later in this video. And for a climbing gym, a shorter, maybe around 40 meters rope is gonna be enough. But check on your gym to see how tall your walls are. Most single ropes will have a black marker indicating the middle of the rope. And this is useful in multiple situations. For example, when you're belaying and you see a middle marker going past your belay device, you should communicate that to your climber. Otherwise, he might not have enough rope to get down from the route. Or when you're setting up the rappel to go down, it's very handy to know where the middle of the rope is. And then, on some of more expensive ropes, you might have completely different pattern on different sides of the rope. So in this case, it's really easy to find the middle of the rope. And you will never miss that black marker again. So cool feature, but more expensive. Now you might find ropes that are labeled as dry. What it means is that they were specially treated to resist water. If the rope is untreated and gets wet, it can absorb up to 50% of its weight. And then it gets very heavy, it gets very difficult to handle, and in very cold conditions it might also freeze. Plus, wet ropes also lose their strength. So if you are planning to climb in cold and wet conditions, then you must have a dry rope. Now, another benefit of a dry treatment that not only it locks the water from getting inside your rope, but also protects from sand and dust. And that greatly extends the life of both your rope and your quick draws, because sand inside your rope makes it like a sandpaper for your quick draws. And on top of that, dry treatment also makes the ropes smoother. So not only it's gonna run through quick draws and belay device with less friction, it's also good against abrasion. Here is Mammoth's untreated rope compared to a dry rope after the same abrasion testing. Okay, so I feel that I sold dry treatment already and I have to say that the downside of dry treatment is its price. Dry ropes are significantly more expensive. If you're planning to use your rope mainly indoors, then you definitely do not need dry rope. Now, if you're planning to use your rope outdoors, but you're not planning to go into cold and wet conditions, then some manufacturers produce ropes that are only sheath dry treated, while the core is not. That gives extra durability compared to completely non-treated ropes. It's cheaper but it's not as durable as fully treated rope. So, the famous question, how many falls you can do on a climbing rope? If you look into the specification of dynamic climbing rope, you will find UIAA fall ratings, and it's gonna be between 5 and 10 falls. And this number confuses a lot of people. For example, I was watching some fun climbing fail videos from Joshua from YouTube channel Beta Climbers. Yeah. And if you like seeing people fail, you should check him out. It's quite ridiculous. And then Joshua said this. And you're only supposed to fall on your rope, um, I think, 10 times. And that's what like the manufacturers say. So that's not true. And let me explain what these UIAA fall ratings mean. When ropes are tested for this standard, they attach 80 kilograms of mass and keep dropping that mass with 5 minutes in between the drops and see how many falls the rope will survive. If you are a nerdy person, here are more details about that test. If you are not, don't worry about this and here is what actually matters. The impact during that test usually begins around 9 kN on the first drop 
and then weigh over 12 kilonewtons on the repeated falls. If you would replace that 80 kilograms mass with the real climber, and the body of the climber would absorb a lot of the impact himself, plus make sure that the other end of the rope is not tied in to something, but it's a belayer which will move up during the fall, you would get forces that are significantly lower than what they achieve during these lab tests. In real life scenarios, the forces are usually around 2 kilonewtons on average falls or 4 kilonewtons on some extremely hard falls. And that means that in real life, if you're not doing something really crazy stupid, it's pretty much impossible to generate forces that would be even close to what we are getting in the lab tests. And that also means that if your rope is not cut or damaged somehow, it's literally impossible to break it on normal real life falls. But still, how many falls you can do on a climbing rope? So this is an example of the rope that I have for two years so far and I've been climbing around every second or every third day for these two years. So I could estimate that I had about a thousand of falls easily on this rope so far. And this includes some small falls, big falls or whippers. So falling almost every climbing session and this rope seen a lot of that. <laughs> So what normally happens is that your end of the climbing rope will wear down way quicker than the middle of the rope because you will be falling on pretty much the same spot again and again and again and that creates very tight radius over the quick draw and with repeated falls your ends of the rope will get worn out. It usually happens about one to two meters away from the end because that's the spot which gets hit on the quick draw on every fall. A test that you can do to assess the damage of the rope is by rolling the rope like this and trying to find a part of the rope where you can completely squeeze the rope like this. And then it's a good idea to compare that to undamaged part of the rope. You can see if I try to squeeze undamaged part of the rope, it's like big angle and it's very nice radius of the rope. However, if I go to the part which is already damaged and soft, this is not good anymore. At this point, I would already cut the end of this rope. If not, you might take few more falls and then this would happen, where the rope got completely wrecked. It's super, super bad. I never seen a rope fucked so hard. And the funniest part, that it happened in two spots during the same climb. So a climber was projecting and he kept falling and falling and falling on his project and he didn't even notice and his rope is like this already. This is crazy and this is super dangerous. So don't wait until this happens to you. So your end of the rope is damaged and you want to cut it. Here is how. Step one, take a piece of climbing tape and wrap it around your rope at the part where you will be cutting it. Then take a sharp knife and carefully cut the rope. And gently melt the tip of the rope to prevent the core from running away. And this is a little life hack. Take a ruler and measure one meter. Starting from the tips of your fingers to where it ends on your body. In my case, it's here. So now for the rest of my life, I have pretty precise one meter measurement on my body. So now I can take the rope piece that I just cut off, measure it, it's one, two meters. So my rope was 80 meters, now it's 78. I can write down so I don't forget about it. In this case, I was just writing with the marker on the tip of the rope, but you should know that it's not okay to write with the marker directly somewhere on the rope. That might damage the rope. 
there are special markers that are okay to use for the ropes but in general there is absolutely no point to do that one thing to keep in mind that the center marker on this rope is not in the center anymore so to fix that you could cut the other end as well however i don't really care on this particular rope for my center mark to be very precise and I know that in the near future I will be cutting the other end as well and then I will make sure that the center marker will become in the center again. For example on this rope I would like to cut both ends of the rope and make the center marker exactly in the center so I find the center marker which is almost invisible on this rope which sucks. Anyway so you grab the center marker and you keep dragging two strands of the rope through your hand and funny enough, my center marker was almost in the center already. Probably I cut it in the center last time. However, as I said, rope tend to shrink over lifetime and probably one side of the rope shrank more. That's why I have this misalignment. Anyway, my ends of the rope are quite fuzzy. So I'm gonna chop about this amount on both of the ropes and then I will know that my center marker is in the center. Good! So my rope is safe to climb again, just a bit shorter. But I can still climb even 40 meters roots with this rope because when I will go down the rope will stretch and it should be fine. And at some point you will cut your rope so much that it's gonna be too short to climb or maybe you will get damage in the middle of the rope or maybe simply your rope is just too old and it doesn't give you confidence anymore. In that case, if you are in Switzerland for some reason, you can drop your rope in one of the collection points and Mammoth will collect those ropes, send for recycling and then your rope will become some other product, which is super cool. You can also send your rope to them free of charge, however it's also limited to Switzerland at this point, but they said that we are gonna expand to Germany and Austria very soon and then to more Europe countries in the future. So I will put more information in the description, depending on when you're watching this video, you can find most up-to-date information. Mammoth actually makes products certified by Blue Sign, which is the strictest textile standard for protecting the environment, the consumer, you, and their workers. From raw material extraction, to air pollution, to wastewaters, to energy use, and chemicals. And speaking about chemicals, all Mammoth's ropes and many other products are without PFC. This crap is often used in water repellent products and it leaches into environment and your body very easily. And that helps you to get tumors and disrupts your hormone system and probably a range of other problems that we are not aware of yet. So if you don't want all of that, support companies that share the same mindset. And as awareness is growing, hopefully this list of companies is gonna be growing as well. And I'm gonna put a link into the description where you can check if the company you care about is on this list. And if it's not, then support somebody else. Now, if you want to extend the life of your rope, here are a couple of tips. First, keep your rope clean. Don't just throw it on the dirty ground. Also, don't step on your rope. And if you're walking along the crag, avoid stepping on somebody else's ropes. This is very, very mean. As I already mentioned before, dust and dirt will damage your rope and will chew through your quick draws like a sandpaper. And the best way to keep your rope clean is to have a rope bag, because every rope bag also acts as a tarp for your rope. So you don't need to place your rope on a dirty ground. And the best part about rope bags is that you will never need to coil your rope again. You simply tie one of your rope ends to the rope bag, stack your rope like a bungee jump, okay. and you're ready to climb. After the climb, simply stack the bungee jump back, and you're ready to climb again. Or if you're done for the day, simply tie your end of the rope to another loop on the rope bag. Normally rope bags will have different colors of these loops and I like to tie the bottom of my rope to the red one and the top to another color. 
If your rope bag doesn't have these collars, it's a good idea to just tie a different knot. For example, on the bottom, I like to tie a stopper knot and on the top, I just tie two simple overhand knots. And since both of the ends of the rope are tied to the rope bag, it's impossible to get a knot in your rope, no matter how you pack it. This rope bag is very easy to pack. It simply rolls like a burrito. Oh, and that's why you need a rope bag. Done. And you have a backpack. And the next time you come to climb, you simply unpack the burrito, it unrolls, you unfold it, and your rope is nice and shiny. Untie your top end of the rope and you're ready to climb. There is no need to coil anything. So, rope bags. Amazing, cheap and gonna outlast all your ropes. This particular rope bag is from Mammoth and I have it already for seven years and I'm actually surprised that absolutely nothing is broken having in mind how strongly I abuse it. And one more tip which extends the life of your rope. Don't climb on the same end of the rope all the time. Change it. And it's very easy to do that after you just finished climbing your route. Sometimes people buy new climbing ropes, climb just for a few times and then we get surprised that the rope is already dirty. The common problem could be your belaying device. For example, Grigri's are notorious for collecting dirt. Look at this one. So clean it. And if your rope is dirty, you should wash it. And it's totally fine to do that in a washing machine. Personally, I just shove it in and that's it. Some people like to daisy chain their ropes before putting inside to prevent tangles, but I actually almost never got any major tangles after washing my ropes, so I don't bother about that. You can buy special detergents for washing climbing ropes, but I personally just run it on water only. The best program to choose is either wool or delicate on 30 degrees and disable spin drying and do not tumble dry. And it's also a good idea to wash the detergent drawer before you hit start. Boom. Once it's done, simply lay your rope, don't hang it and don't dry in the sun. Okay, now this tip is not only gonna extend the life of your rope, but it's super important for your safety. Imagine that you're lowering your climber. And now imagine that your climber is about to swing and the rope will be going against a sharp edge. Let's say this is a sharp edge. In that case, don't stop lowering. If you stop lowering during the swing, the same spot of the rope will be running against a sharp edge and it's super dangerous, the rope might get cut. On the other hand, if you keep lowering, the new spot of the rope will get in contact with the sharp edge. This is so much safer. Now, I have mentioned this already in a video about slings, but you should definitely avoid friction between two soft materials. So, for example, rope running against another rope is really bad idea. Same goes with rope running against a sling or sling running against the rope. It might damage your equipment or in some cases even cut it. Now, the bonus question. Why do ropes do this? Why do ropes twist and kink? It's super annoying when you're belaying and suddenly a twist in the rope gets jammed in your belaying device. So why does this happen? The first reason is similar to a ribbon effect. If you have a ribbon and you run it across a very sharp edge, multiple times like so it will curl and that can happen to the rope as well if it's running over very tight radius for example if your quick draw has very very deep groove then during the fall the rope will be forced over super tight radius which might twist the rope 
So that's another reason to avoid very worn out quick draws. But this is only a minor issue. The bigger issue is this. If you have an anchor with two not connected points and you would try to lower yourself off such anchor like this, you would just go down. This would create a lot of twisting in your rope. So here you can see the twisting in action. Notice how the little piece of tape that I put is rolling around the rope. So if you encounter such anchor and you want to avoid rope twisting, the best idea is to repel using a tubular device on both strands of the rope. So in this case, the rope is not running across the anchor under load. And when you get down, you pull out the rope and pulling the rope through such anchor without the load should avoid twisting. Okay, so let's say your rope is twisted and you want to untwist it. One method is to take your tubular belaying device, connect it to the anchor, the tree or your friend, set up a top rope belaying system and keep pulling your rope through it. And then you will need to kind of work the tangles as you go. Like so. And that was actually enough for this rope. If your rope is super, super twisted, you might need to repeat this multiple times. And another way to untwist your rope, which is even better in my opinion, and that's what I do most of the time, is to find a route which has a proper anchor with one equalized center point, and then you pull entire rope through that anchor. It helps if the route is a little bit overhanging, and then when you're pulling, you want to give rope some help to untwist and shake it a little bit. Whee! And that's it. If you do this multiple times after a few roots, your rope should be free of twists. And that's it. If you learned something and you want more, consider subscribing. And if you want more faster, consider supporting me via donations. You can find the link here. And that helps me a lot. So thank you for that and see you in the next video. Enjoy climbing!